So um, today our first session is on the archaeologies of writing, and our first speaker that you will probably all know, whether by from speaking to him or just emails about the conference. So it's Dr. Philip Boyce, and his paper will draw on the case study of late Bronze Age Ugarit to explore the social archaeology of writing systems. Thank you. Uh, right, so I should preface this by saying that this is sort of half thought through thoughts and in many ways this conference is intended to sort of complete those thoughts or at least help me work through them. So I'm not going to put forward a lot of kind of conclusive statements or a lot of answers. I'm just going to ask a lot of questions and kind of say how I think I should be going about answering them. Um, if it turns out that I'm talking nonsense, please do tell me because it's useful for me to rethink things at this stage rather than in a year. Um, so, uh, archaeological theory, as many of you will know, is quite a kind of magpie um, area. It tends to grab things from um, literature, from philosophy, from social anthropology, um, to create this great conglomeration of ideas and ways of doing things. But it doesn't tend to talk very much about writing, at least not writing in the sense of actual writing. It tends to talk about writing as a metaphor. So we might say things like reading the past or writing the landscape, things like that, but we don't actually talk about writing. So what I'm trying to do today is think about what an archaeology of writing might actually look like. And um, the first thing to say is why um, I don't think archaeology really talks about writing. And many of you, I'm sure, already know this, is that um, archaeology and inscribed objects tend to be published very separately. Um, so as soon as something is noticed to be inscribed, it gets carted off to a different set of specialists, the epigraphers, the paleographers, the philologists, and is dealt with as texts. It's um, then not really, at least in the Near East where I work, um, not really considered alongside the rest of the archaeological assemblage. Um, to give you an example of this, this is a page, oh, I'm not blocking that, uh, from the Corpus of Alphabetic Uniform Inscriptions at Ugarit, which uh, this is not chosen for any particular reason, it's just a, a random entry. So you can see we have a little bit of contextual information there. We've got, we're told it's in the Royal Palace in Court 5, and we're given a plant topographic. Unfortunately, there's nothing in this book to tell you where that uh, topographic point is. In fact, there's nothing in any book to tell you where that topographic point is, unless you get lucky and it happens to be marked on one of the original 1930s excavation maps, but they not all are. And it doesn't tell you on those whether they um, refer to inscribed objects or other objects or what they refer to at all. As far as I know, there is no central register of these. I think the information has been lost. Um, there is a depth, but the depth refers is relative to the ground surface, which obviously ceased to exist as soon as they excavated it. <laughs> so that's completely pointless. Um, we have the measurements of the object. Uh, we're not actually told what kind of object it is. We have to assume that it's a clay tablet, but not everything from Ugarit is. Uh, we're not told what shape it is, what condition it's in, what fabric it's made of. We're told basically nothing. Uh, we don't have any photographs. We don't have any illustrations. Uh, we don't have any translations. We have a transcription of the, of the inscription on the tablet, but that is absolutely no help if you're just, if you're doing anything other than a kind of philological study of the language. It's no use whatsoever for an archaeologist or a historian. Um, and I'm not trying to pick on these particular editors. I'm just saying this is fairly typical, if a reasonably extreme case, of the way things are done in Near Eastern archaeology. Um, that's not to say that there's been no kind of progress in this area at all. So the last 10, 15 years in particular, there has been the rise of kind of materiality studies uh, by which people generally are interested in a lot of the things I've just been mentioning, the, what the object is made of, what kind of object it is, how the inscription is made, things like the actual processes of writing, and a lot of what we do at Cruise kind of falls into this category. That said, this can still be quite limited from a kind of archaeological <coughs> point of view. It's, um, even amongst this kind of writing, it's still um, common to hear inscribed objects referred to as things like text vehicles or material supports, as if they only exist to kind of substantiate this text that you want to bring into the world and needs to have a body. Um, they're, st they're also more concerned with the inscribed object than they are with kind of where it's found, how it was used, who it was used by, and the other uninscribed objects that it was found in association with. So 
I'm not trying to kind of knock materiality studies. I think it's great, but it's not everything we need to be doing. Um, so what do we need to be doing? Um, the clue is in the title to my talk. I think we need to be doing a social archaeology of writing. Um, for those, so, well, it's probably worth me kind of saying what I mean by social archaeology, and the answer is that it's an incredibly broad umbrella <coughs> term, which encompasses a whole um, list of things. So this is, uh, I don't, haven't picked this book for any particular reason other than the fact that it's a handbook. I think it's published in 2005. <coughs> and these are some of the things covered in its contents pages. Um, I think we can add a few more to this as things that social archaeology might include. Um, now this breadth, I think, might seem daunting, but I think it can be quite useful for us. It gets us out of these very kind of defined ways of thinking about inscriptions and inscribed objects and does give us this huge repertoire of different routes and paths we can be taking for studying them. Uh, not all of them are necessarily uh, self-evident in how they apply to writing, at least I assume this. Um, I was going, well, as you will see, the next slide I use the body as an example. Um, so kind of embodiments, how we subjectively experience the world through our bodies is um, one of the kind of interesting um, avenues of social archaeology. And it, at least to me, didn't seem to self-evidently relate to writing, although we heard yesterday about lots of ways in which it does, so maybe that was just me. Um, but this is just to give you an example of some of the other things that can kind of relate to writing to the body. So things like tattoos, these are Soviet 1980s prison tattoos, which obviously uh, directly related to kind of they're on the body, they relate to the experience the person has been through, where they're placed fundamentally affects how they're interpreted. On the right here, we have this really interesting reference from Assyria in the first millennium BC, um, which refers to a slave girl who's been dedicated at a temple. Um, who is self-inscribing herself with a dedication formula, which is cool for just so many reasons. It's like person as speaking object, but also it tells us about female literacy and slave literacy. So I don't really know what to do with that, but it is interesting. Um, and I'm not going to go through kind of every different thing on that social archaeology heading, but I, just to say that I think if we did do that, we'd find every single one of them is relevant to archaeology, not to archaeology, to writing systems. Um, so... I just want to kind of say a sort of set of general principles, if you like, for the social archaeology of writing. So writing is a human practice, which means that it's fundamentally going to be um, bound up in the ways that people uh, experience the world. It is going to be embodied, it is going to be mediated by our senses, and it's going to be mediated by our ideas, our beliefs and our culture. Um, Writing is a social practice, which means it has to be analysed alongside other social practices, not in isolation. Um, its social role isn't just limited to people who are writing or are reading. It has to apply to everybody. We have to think about the non-elites, the non-literates, and the people outside of the urban centres, um, or wherever it is that you know writing is centred. We heard yesterday again about kind of non-urban writing. Um, it's material. We're not dealing with texts, we're not dealing with inscriptions, we're dealing with objects which are inscribed, and it's important to make that distinction. And that being inscribed is not necessarily the most important feature of any object. Instead, the meanings of an object and its importance are not fixed. They're going to be dependent on context, on time, who is using them, when and for what purposes. Now, nothing I'm saying there is particularly novel from a sort of archaeological methodology point of view. All I'm trying to say is we should apply the same sort of ways in which we treat other material culture to inscribed material culture. So that brings us to the question of agency and practice. Now, this is <laughs> an area I kind of went back and forth on how much I wanted to talk about because um, for a lot of you in the room, agency is going to be a kind of quite passe term. We've been well used to using it for 30 years. And... Others in the room possibly haven't come across it quite so much. So I'm going to hopefully not get stuck between the two camps and um, be horribly simplistic for those of you who know what I'm talking about and just sound like I'm talking nonsense to those of you who don't. Um, so this is a kind of what I hope is a very brief introduction to kind of agency and practice ideas that all human practice is a kind of interaction between agency and structures. The structures are not fixed, but they are the results of human practice. So we end up with this kind of very cyclical um, way in which people are defining 
um, creating the limitations, creating the structures against which or in accordance to which they then take actions. Um, it's not just about intentionality, it's not just about thinking about people's decisions, although that can be an important part of it, um, but it's about thinking about how people are reacting to a social context. Um, and that includes not just people, but objects as well, how people are reacting to the objects around them. Um, and basically, I think the most important thing I want to get across is that agency is not just a kind of a property of hum the human mind, but it's a property of the relationship between things. It's fundamentally this kind of relational um, way of looking at the world. Um, and that ties into it not just being some like thinking about human agency, but also thinking about the agency of objects. Uh, this is something which has grown particularly in the last, so, I don't know, 15 years or so. Um, the idea that the objects, material culture can have agency too. So that can sound counterintuitive, but to take an example of a chair, you can use that for a whole range of things. You know, I could use it as a display stand for this microphone, but probably I'm not going to do that because it's too low down, it's too soft, things are going to fall over. Whereas in fact, what the chair is extremely good for is sitting on. Um, I don't know about these chairs, but anyway. Um, <laughs> Another example, Malafurus gives the example of a potter creating a pot on a wheel. This, the pot is not just the result of some decision that the potter has made, but it's the interaction of what the potter has in his mind, um, the way the wheel moves, the technological characteristics of the wheel, and the material properties of the clay, the water, um, the temperature that he's working in, all those kind of things. Sorry, I should say he, she, or they are working in. Um, so I hope that gets across what I'm getting at. So. Um, this kind of leads to a view of objects and people which is extremely interrelated, everything's tangled up with everything else, um, it's quite messy. Which means how do we actually go about using that? So that's fine as a kind of way of thinking about the world, but what do we actually have to do? Um, I've got four sort of headings here which I'm going to go through one at a time obviously, but I don't think of these as being a thing you do one, and then you do the next, and then you do the next. You have to move backwards and forwards. It's going to depend on the objects. It's going to depend on what kind of questions you're asking. So the most basic thing is like physical characteristics. And this goes back to what I was saying earlier about materiality. What kind of object is it? Size, weight, fabric. Also things that don't directly relate to the inscription. So if it's a vessel, what contents analysis can we do? What did it contain? Because that's important. Um, what's the actual archaeological context of it? So where was it found? What stratigraphic relationships did it have? Uh, what kind of deposit is it and how did it get there? You know, was it just dropped there through our everyday use? Was it disposed of? Or was it dedicated? Is this a destruction um, event? And again, it's crucial that we pay as much attention to the uninscribed stuff in these contexts as we do to the inscribed ones, because that's what's going to determine how these objects relate to each other, how they relate to the wider social structure. Uh, just to give you an example, this is again is from Ugarit. So some of these, they're called axes in the publication, but they're really adzes or hoes. Um, they're bronze tools of some kind. Some of these are inscribed, not all of them. But they're found as part of this, um, probably a dedication cache or foundation deposit, alongside lots of other bronze objects. Um, most of which, in fact all of which I think are uninscribed. Now, people don't generally talk about the things that are not inscribed in this context. They don't talk about it as a foundation deposit. They talk about five inscribed axes, which is just not what it is. Um, so the next thing I have on those kind of categories of things we need to do is exploring meaning and agency, trying to get at those connections between objects and people, objects and other objects. This is the difficult one. And there's various kind of frameworks that have been put forward for how we do that. I'm not going to go through these in huge depth, partly because I don't have time and partly because um, there are other people in this room who are far more experts on it than me. Um, so one of them is chain opératoire, which is a kind of going through the, the precise technical steps necessary to make an object, to use an object, and I'm pretty sure Marsha Ann is going to talk to us about that tomorrow. Um, John Robb has kind of put forward a view where he kind of identifies three different sets of kind of meanings, so he talks about structural meanings, general meanings, contextual meanings. Um, that's very useful. I recommend reading that article, but I can't go through that right now. Um, the other thing that we can do uh, is, in a way, it's sort of less theory, it's less kind of methodologically rigorous, 
which is just to borrow questions from social archaeology to say, um, we have this object, how does it relate to the body? How does it relate to gender? How does it relate to identity? And so on. Um, it's nothing fancy from a kind of methodological point of view, but as we'll see, it's not, that doesn't mean it's not worth doing. Um, the final thing we can do is then step back from these individual objects and try and draw more general conclusions. To so think about not just objects, but writing systems and the places they occupy in societies. Uh, the final thing I want to say is that when I talk about writing systems, I'm not thinking about them as kind of self-contained, discrete entities. Um, in much the same way as in the past, archaeologists used to talk about cultures as if they were these very delineated things that interacted and had particular characteristics, particular sets of material culture. Um, but we don't do that anymore. We think of them as fuzzy-edged, as sort of useful labels that we apply to things, but we know they don't really exist and that they, you know, you get to the margins and it doesn't really matter whether something is Mycenaean or Anatolian because it's doing really interesting things. Um, I'm not going to harp on this point, but I think that's sort of how we have to think about writing systems. Um, I tried to graph this. This, this was at the last cruise conference. I don't expect you to, to decipher this. I just want to show it as a, a messy kind of visualisation of how everything ends up connecting to everything else and it gets incredibly complicated. But I think it's better to think of things to messy, you know, fuzzy edged and complicated rather than these discrete things that can interact in simple ways. Right, so that's the theory side. Um, I'm now going to move on to the case study uh, and talk about Ugarit. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Ugarit um, is here on the Syrian coast. Um, it's a reasonably small city in the Late Bronze Age, so the period we're interested in is about 1400 to 1175 BC. Ugarit has a very long history before that, but we just don't know very much about it. Um, at 1175 it gets destroyed, so that, that's kind of an end point. And this is the, the period <coughs> for which we have um, good evidence of the use of writing. Um, Ugarit con controls a smallish kingdom on the Levantine coast and is technically speaking a vassal of the Hittite Empire at this period, although it's given an, a reasonably free hand to do what it wants within reason. They tend to get told off but not actually punished for, for doing things. Um, and what Ugarit is most famous for is the alphabetic cuneiform writing system. Um, I don't have time to go into the specifics of this, but uh, obviously this is a kind of um, mixing of the ideas of the Mesopotamian cuneiform system with the uh, kind of structural way of working of the Levantine uh, linear alphabets that we heard about yesterday. <coughs> Uh, that's not the only writing system being used at Ugarit. It's about half of the, the main corpus. There's also an awful lot of Akkadian in Mesopotamian cuneiform and lots of other things going on as well in small numbers. Uh, and this written material is not concentrated in a single place on the site. So we have a number of things from the royal palace here in the, the western part of the site. But we also have private residences and religious residences slash I'm not quite sure, but some sort of religious structures um, right across the site from which we find archives or collections <laughs> of written material. Um, the problem is that that's about as much contextual information as we have in many cases. So um, this is the list of publications of the Royal Palace, uh, which began excavation, I think, in the early 1930s. It's been thoroughly published in five volumes. We have the, the text in cuneiform from the East, West and Central Archives, the text in cuneiform from, this, again, um, so on. All the texts have been thoroughly published very nicely for the time. Um, volume one, which was going to deal with everything that wasn't an inscribed object, the <laughs> actual palace, uh, the material culture, the stratigraphy. Uh, we're still waiting for that. Uh, that's probably never going to come out, and that's also true for the, the temples, a lot of the other structures on the site of Ugarit. I would love to say that this is just the way archaeology in the Near East was in the 1930s <coughs> and early 20th century, but unfortunately it's not the case. So this is the House of Ertenu, which is the most recently excavated main kind of collection of written material from Ugarit. It was excavated in the 19, late 1980s and early 1990s. 
I have no reason to believe this was anything other than a thoroughly professional modern excavation in which all the material was properly recorded and has been kept, and somebody somewhere knows where everything came from. Um, a nice preliminary publication came out fairly promptly, which told us this, that we have huge amounts of information and we're going to produce the full publication. We're going to be able to do so much more with this that we couldn't do with the, the rest of the site because we know all the different material culture and we know where it came from. Um, yeah, that hasn't come out either. So when we come to actually looking at these connections, the relationships between things, the relationships between objects and people, that leaves us with a problem. Like, chain opératoire, looking at the way things are used, the technical steps that people are going through. I'm not sure I can do that with the kind of material I have from Ugarit. I would love to be able to, but I'm not sure how possible it is. Um, Rob's scheme, again, I can do bits of it, and I can do bits of it for certain contexts, like that foundation deposit I showed you earlier. I can probably make that fit within Rob's kind of approach to this. But that's one context that they took pains to kind of record as a context in ways they didn't with everything else. Um, so I can't really do that for most of this stuff either. I can sort of do this. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to ask social archaeological questions of this material. Um, I can't go through every kind of social archaeological question, so I'm just going to give you one example, which is um, the archaeology of place and landscape. Um, now, that might seem counterintuitive when I've just said we basically don't know where anything was found. But I'm not so much interested in space as a kind of three-dimensional matrix into which we slot things and place them on a map. I'm interested in space as a social concept. Um, space is, um, I haven't actually written who said this, I think this was Harman Sar writing about a site in Anatolia. Um, he says that spaces are imagined, mythologized, marginalized and contested, but spaces exist in our kind of collective cultural, um, I don't know what the word is, uh, you get the point anyway. Um, writing can relate very strongly to how we think about and relate to places. So on the top left here, this is the Nafrel Kelb, which is a river mouth just north of Beirut, where you have this extraordinary collection of monumental inscriptions, starting with Ramesses II and going right the way up to the modern Lebanese Republic in the 21st century. I can't remember how many it is, it's about 13 or something, but um, you've got Ramesses, you've got Asha, I think it's Ashurbanipal, um, you've got uh, the British Army, you've got Napoleon, you've got the Lebanese Republic, it's amazing. Plus you've got um, graffiti as well, so unofficial inscriptions. Um, oops, I don't know that That's obviously, I think, a 1940s, 50s typing pool, which is again a place defined by its relationship with writing, but in a very different way. Um, and a kind of graffiti covered um, lower status area. We can relate to these places, we think about them, we move through them in very different ways and the way that writing helps define these places is important. So what can we do in that kind of regard as Ugarit? Well past studies of place at Ugarit and the relationship with writing have tended to focus on archives, on trying to pin down what sort of breakdown of inscriptions we have in particular archives, so what writing systems are found, whether there's a preference by genre, things like that. And that's important, I'm not knocking that, but I want to try and do something slightly different. I think there's two things we can do. So one is thinking a bit about accessibility, and the other one is thinking about how writing relates to wider landscapes. Um, okay, so one thing we tend to think we know about the locations of tablets and other written material is that it's close. We have rough general rooms in which it was found, and we think it probably fell from upper stories in most cases because of the way the tablets are scattered. So, what can we do with that? Well, as we don't have the upper stories, but the general working assumption is that these are probably the more private areas of the houses. Um, probably including the sort of elite residential areas, whereas the ground floors are more like reception rooms, workshops, um, more public areas. Um, I'm not going to go into why people think that now, but um, that seems a reasonable starting point. People, when they talk about why the tablets are upstairs, generally say it's to do with security. And yeah, there's probably something in that. You don't want anybody walking in and making off with your diplomatic correspondence with the pharaoh. 
But there's also social implications and implications for kind of the visibility, the accessibility of writing within the city. So first thing we can say is, are these store areas, are these kind of storage areas where tablets are just kept or is it also where the tablets have been produced? And we don't know. But you need three things to make a clay tablet. You need clay, you need water, and you need to be able to see what you're doing because cuneiform is small and it's fiddly and it relies very much on shadows and light. So if you're doing that in a, an upstairs room, probably with a small window, perhaps an interior room, that doesn't seem very practical. So there's a possibility that tablets are maybe being stored in one place and produced somewhere else, uh, maybe in courtyards, maybe on rooftop terraces, in which case we have to think about a situation where we have scribes going up and down the stairs, out onto the rooftops, um, then bringing things back to the private residential parts of the houses with their muddy clay hands on everything. How does that affect the relationship between the scribes, the people living in the houses and so on? Um, if people are writing on the roofs, that also affects how much people outside these houses might know about what's going on. Um, you, if these houses have rooftop terraces and we have every reason, reason to think that they do, and people are on the next rooftop across writing, then you can see what they're doing. You might not be able to see the details of it, but you can see that they're doing something. And that is important for thinking about the social status of writing in the grid. Um, the other thing we can talk about is the uh, temples on the Acropolis. So we have two, uh, the Temple of Baal and the Temple of Dagan, and they're both fairly um, similar to this architecture, as far as we can tell. They're tower temples um, of a kind of fairly standard Near Eastern type. Uh, we have inscribed material from here, and pretty much uniquely for Ugarit, this is public display stuff. So it's things like uh, stelae, which record dedications. Uh, this is an Egyptian funerary stele, which is really interesting for a range of reasons I can't go into now. Uh, but we also have prestige goods, which um, again have dedication formulae on them, so actual votives. Now people say that these come from the temples, but it's a little bit more complicated than that. Uh, we don't know where exactly in the temple grounds these would have come from. So are they in the courtyard? Are they in the kind of outer bit of the interior temple? Are they in the, the kind of holy of holies? Uh, we don't know. We also don't know how people kind of move through and relate to act in these temples or how accessible they are, how much light there is, things like that. Um, which begs the question, what can we actually do? Like, How can we think about the social role of these buildings when we know virtually nothing about how people are interacting with them? Um, the answer, or at least my answer, is that we can try and think about the social role of other buildings in either contemporary or historically more well-documented um, contexts. I was trying to think what might be a good example for these kind of terribly forbidding um, fortress-like uh, temples with their writing inside. And um, this is the University Library in Cambridge. So it's got a tower. It's not got a lot of windows in the tower. Um, they've even, the people tend to reconstruct these little um, fires on top of the temples in Ugarit. Uh, we've got a nice little clean snow. <laughs> so um, I'm not <coughs> going to belabor the parallels here, but um, the university library looms over a fairly low rise town. It is not accessible to the vast majority of the population. Um, you have to be an initiate. And even for the people who are allowed in, it's not what you would call a beloved building. Um, it's a respected building. People have a lot of kind of, I don't know, reverence perhaps for the, the written material which is in there, the, the accumulated knowledge of um, at least British copyright publication. Um, but people don't tend to love it or um, kind of, yes, yeah, I don't think it's anybody's favorite building. It also has mythology that's arisen. So there's this story that the, the tower is rammed full of Victorian pornography. Um, this is not true, as the university is at pains to point out at the same time as it's using it to promote its latest exhibition. <laughs> So, um, yeah, my point is that not that, oh, the temples in Ugarit are the same as the University Library in Cambridge, clearly they're not, but that by thinking about these places and the roles and the mythologies and the way people interact with them in other contexts, we can perhaps start to ask different questions of ancient ones. Um, the wrinkle to this is that those temples are not even necessarily there. So 
There was an an earthquake in Ugarit about 1250 BC, which destroyed both the temples on the Acropolis, as well as a lot of other structures throughout the the site. Uh, The Temple of Dagan seems to be rebuilt more or less immediately, although uh, I should also say 1250 is about the start of the alphabetic cuneiform period. So throughout the period we're interested in, the Temple of Dagan is presumably being rebuilt. And we don't know, you know, how in use is it for all this period? How accessible is it? Is it reaped in scaffolding? What, how does that affect its social purpose? The Temple of Dagon is even more interesting because that isn't rebuilt. I don't know whether they never meant to rebuild or whether they just didn't get around to it before the city was destroyed. But they clear the site, but they continue to use it for ritual purposes. So I said that this stele was from a temple, and that's what most of the publications say, but it's not. It's from the site where the Temple of Dagon used to be. So when we're thinking about the social role of these places, this affects the accessibility, obviously, because there's no temple there to obscure this. But also, we have to think about things that are present in their absence, about sacred sites that are defined by the absence of a temple, not by a temple actually being there. And that's why I put up the Western Wall in Jerusalem and Grand Zero in New York, because I think those are much more useful parallels for this kind of um, site. So. I don't have a lot of time left, but I'm going to very briefly talk about the wider landscape. Uh, as I said at the beginning, there is a, a wider kingdom of Ugarit. Um, we have lots of place names, more than just these, but these are all taken from administrative tablets found in the capital. There's been, as far as I know, no kind of in-depth survey work. There's been a little bit of excavation at secondary centres like Gibala, at the secondary palace at Rasib and Hani and Rasul Bassett, but not really any archaeological investigation of the hinterland at all. So what can we do with writing in an area we know nothing about archaeologically? Well, one thing we can say is that it looks like Ugarit isn't doing something that neighbouring polities tend to do, which is inscribing the landscape with monumental reliefs. So I've put Nahrel Kelb up again, and this is an inscription from um, South East Anatolia, um, we don't have anything like that from Ugarit, and I don't think it's just because there hasn't been a comprehensive survey. This area has been continuously inhabited for as long as anyone can remember. I think if there was stuff like this, we probably would have known about it by now, um, at least some of it. So we could speculate on why it might be that Ugarit's not doing this. Is it because these are done by great imperial powers um, as they try to move through the landscape and put their stamp on it? And Ugarit is not on really on the way to anywhere. It's sort of a cul-de-sac on the Levantine roots. Is it because Ugarit wants to mark itself out as different from these imperial powers, which were time and some of the other things going on in its culture um, in this period? We don't know. Um, How does the kind of delineation and um, ordering of the landscape in these administrative tablets affect the way people are thinking about it? So if you're a scribe and you interact with the hinterland mainly through tablets, that's very different from somebody who lives in it and has a much more kind of social, experienced approach to the the, um, hinterland, the landscape. How is this information being gathered? Are we to think about literate administrators going out and sort of touring the landscape, taking down information? Are people having to send in the information? Are there village scribes? Again, we don't know. what social mobility is there from the villages to the capital? How do you go from being living in a small village in the middle of Ugarit to being a senior scribe? Now, we know that people did this. Um, our most famous scribe is a man called Ilimilku the Shubanite. Um, he is responsible for writing down all the main literary um, texts to Ugarit, uh, as well as some other things. Um, he is also a Theite of Nick Madu. Now, we don't know exactly what a Theite is, but it's some sort of senior um, political, possibly religious role. Uh, we know where Shubanu is, well, roughly, because of the administrative tablets. It's a small village in the middle of the kingdom with about 15 households. So how do you go from the one to the other? Don't know, but clearly you can. So, conclusions. Um, The second half of this, I've voiced a lot of questions. I've done a lot of speculation. What I haven't done is the kind of methodological approach that I outlined in the first half. So was that a waste of time? Um, No, I think is the answer. And there's two main reasons why. One is that we can try by articulating this and saying what people should be doing. I hope that we can improve the situation for the future. And then maybe we can do that. 
And the second one is that the kinds of questions I'm asking fundamentally, at least to me, come from the approach that I took in the first half, thinking through those things, thinking about having them in mind. And even if I can't do the kind of rigorous approach that I would love to do, I think that I can at least ask new questions because of thinking through it that way. Thank you, and sorry I overran. <laughs>